Namaste and welcome to Atharva Forum. What is the first image that comes to your mind when you hear the word slavery? An African being treated despicably by some white European on a ship or a plantation? The history of slavery, however, is more widespread than just Africa and equally gruesome. The history of slavery is a story of domination and betrayal, a story of displacement, a search for identity, and of course, a story of grit and survival. Also, the history of slavery perpetrated on our own ancestors by the European powers is largely untold. In this episode, my intention is to focus on some key aspects of slavery and indenture that form a part of our own history. A system that was largely driven by commercial and evangelistic interests of the British Empire. The idea is not to provide an exhaustive study, but to provide an overview that I hope could trigger a deeper interest. We have read about Columbus, Vespucci, Da Gama, Magellan, and our history books give a pretty rosy picture of their voyages as if they were just exploring new lands to study the grass that grows and the beasts that graze upon it. The Portuguese and the Spanish, rival powers in those days, started the trend of navigating the unknown world in the 15th and 16th centuries, unknown to them, of course. And then the other rising European powers joined in a frenzy that has not been seen since. The one who started it all in 1492, Christopher Columbus, as we all know, was looking for India. The Europeans loved spices so much that they wanted to find the goose from which the spicy golden eggs came. In fact, in his first letter, after setting his feet on what later became the Americas, Columbus talked about the recently discovered islands of India beyond the Ganges. This was the name given to the parts of India that were unknown to the Europeans. The letter itself is more important beyond the obvious headline-grabbing Himalayan blunder by Columbus. And the interesting part comes at the end. And let me read you the excerpts from the translation. Let us all thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has bestowed so great a victory and reward upon us. Let Christ rejoice upon earth as he rejoices in heaven, as he foresees that so many souls of so many people heretofore lost or to be saved. And let us be glad not only for the exaltation of our faith, but also for the increase of temporal prosperity in which not only Spain, but all Christendom is about to share. So. Those were the two pillars of what would soon become European colonialism, commerce and Christ. And the voyage by Columbus started it all. Following the voyage in 1493, Pope Alexander VI decreed through a series of papal bulls the right of Portugal and Spain to conquer overseas territories and spread the boundaries of Christianity. The Pope wished that the barbarous nations be overthrown and brought to the faith itself. He also praised Columbus, whose discovery of unknown islands was a momentous occasion because the inhabitants can now embrace the Catholic faith and be trained in good morals. The bull, by the way, was not just for the recently explored territories by Columbus, but covered all territories that would be discovered in the future, except those that were already under Christendom. The bull, therefore, divided the non-Christian world into two to be conquered and colonized by Portugal and Spain. Chillingly, the bull made no reference to preserving the faith of the native inhabitants as they were already considered as barbarous, or in other words, unworthy unless they embrace the Catholic faith. And, you know, we have to understand the reasoning carefully here because the church considered the native inhabitants as heathen, uncivilized, barbarous, doomed, almost inhuman, which is what allowed the colonial powers to enslave them and treat them like beasts. While the inhabitants obviously had no clue that their lands would be quartered and their traditions would be uprooted soon, the other European powers felt obviously left out of usurping what was turning out to be a pretty humongous world with lots and lots of land and people. The Americas were still too far, an accident that happened while searching for India, but Africa was close by and the European powers were already claiming large coasts of the continent for themselves. The age of discovery, as the Europeans call it and foist it upon the rest of the world, started in the early 15th century with the Portuguese exploring the coast of West Africa. After the European discovery of the Americas, the West African coast simply provided convenient ports from where to transfer goods, 
and more importantly procure and transport slaves to the new world the interiors of africa by the way were taken over by islamic slave traders around the same time by the mid 16th century the european powers had formed a formidable trade network in the americas a triangular trade was created to trade goods from europe to africa in exchange for slaves trade slaves to their colonies in the americas in exchange for other goods and transport these goods back to europe essentially slaves were traded and treated just like other cargo a commodity to be exchanged at the highest profits and the lowest expenses the transatlantic slave trade as it is known or more commonly the middle passage only became worse as the plantation economy kicked in the europeans had by then occupied large tracts of land in the americas primarily the caribbean and parts of south america which was then converted to plantations for coffee tobacco cotton sugar and other products sugar however was the key in the mid 17th century the dutch merchants introduced sugar to barbados which was under british occupation at that time the introduction of sugar caused some major upheavals with far reaching consequences first harvesting sugar cane and producing sugar required a lot more labor than the native population and the convict population brought in from europe could provide the solution was to bring in more slaves from africa second the demand for sugar meant that numerous smaller farms which were used for cotton and tobacco were consolidated with a few landowners who monopolized the land for sugar cultivation with the land monopoly came more and more restrictions on the rights of slaves especially considering slaves as property including the children born to them which meant that they can all be sold as cheap goods if commerce and christ were the pillars of european colonialism sugar and slavery became the pillars of european commerce by the late 17th century the british and the dutch were the largest slave traders and with their rivalry increasing the british crown passed a series of acts granting british companies monopoly over their trade along the western coast of africa the royal african company which was established in 1660 as a part of such a charter traded more slaves across the atlantic than any other company the so called middle passage of which much is written especially about the conditions of the slaves and how they were treated and dominated by the european plantation owners or planters the counterpart of the royal african company in the indian subcontinent was the british east india company which was formed much earlier in 1600 and went on to become the largest company in the world thanks to the plunder of the subcontinent the east india company was created to strip the spanish and the portuguese of the trade monopoly in southeast asia especially the trade of spices the biggest competition to the east india company was its dutch counterpart the dutch east india company which was also created around the same time to plunge into the spice trade with parts of southeast asia india and southern africa by the late 1700s east india company had settlements in ports of southeast asia many of which had considerable indian laborers who were often called coolies the origin of the word kooli is shrouded in mystery and some believe that it comes from the tamil word kooli which means wages in any case the word was popularized by the portuguese around the 17th century who then spread it to other european nations and kooli as a word became common across european colonies in asia from india and china to ceylon and japan and came to mean a laborer who is employed to do menial tasks In his book The History of Java written in 1817 Thomas Raffles the founder of modern Singapore wrote of all the imports from China that which produces the most extensive effects on the commercial and political interests of the country is the native himself besides their cargoes these junks junks or ships bring a valuable import of 2 to 500 industrious natives in each vessel these emigrants are usually employed as coolies on their first arrival but by frugal habits and persevering industry they soon become possessed of a little property which they employ in trade and increase by their prudence and enterprise indian laborers were transported as slaves from the south indian coast especially the malabar coast to mauritius first by the dutch then the french and then the british 
by the early 1800s there were 6000 indian laborers as slaves in mauritius and thousands elsewhere mostly kidnapped through devious means and transported to the colonies one key source of the laborers were the convicts as the british thought it better to ship long term convicts to their colonies and make them do construction work instead of filling the prisons with them or awarding them the death penalty the first batch of such convicts was shipped to mauritius in 1815 and made to work on constructing buildings and roads incidentally charles darwin when he had stopped in mauritius on his voyage about the hms beagle would later write about them he said before seeing these people i had no idea that the inhabitants of india were such noble looking figures their skin is extremely dark and many of the older men had large mustaches and beards of a snow white color this together with the fire of their expression gave them quite an imposing aspect the greater number had been banished for murder and the worst crimes others for causes which can scarcely be considered as moral faults such as for not obeying from superstitious motives the english laws these men are generally quiet and well conducted from their outward conduct their cleanliness and faithful observance of their strange religious rites it was impossible to look at them with the same eyes as on our wretched convicts in new south wales the last one wretched convicts in new south wales were mostly english with some irish even earlier the europeans had employed seamen known as lascars from the indian subcontinent as well as other regions such as southeast asia and the middle east Lascar the word comes from the persian lashkar an army or a troop if you recall vasco da gama had arrived in india in 1498 and the recruitment of lascars in all probability must have started by then lascars from india were employed heavily by the portuguese and the spanish during the heyday of their exploration around the world and from there lascars found their way to the british expeditions apparently the first ships from the east india company to sail to india employed lascars who were from india this is not surprising because by then more than a century had passed since the arrival of the portuguese on indian shores lascars like slaves were subjected to long hours of work lower wages substandard food unhealthy conditions and in general harsh treatment also like slaves lascars were hardly subject to any proper contracts although as we would see soon contracts would hardly make the life of the worker easier because they were anyway heavily one sided unlike slaves however who were confined to their plantations lascars had to find themselves a home away from the ships and consequently they crowded in port towns and other cities often in dire conditions of poverty and disease and usually taken care of by missionary organizations the story of lascars should also be told but in this episode we focus on the more specific group the ones the european called coolies in 1807 the british abolished slave trade in the empire not the practice of slavery itself in other words no slaves could be transported from africa to the colonies but the colonies themselves continued to practice slavery as plantations had to be kept profitable much later in 1833 slavery itself was abolished and with that the british pushed other european powers to follow suit in banning slave trade as well as slavery as a consequence of this act more than 800000 people of african descent in the americas especially in the plantations looked forward to a free life but this was not to be the case under the conditions of the emancipation act of 1833 and later orders former slaves were still bound as apprentices for a period of 4 years the british government even appointed magistrates to ensure that slavery in any form was not perpetuated however this was not the case as the planters even revived old laws and pushed the former slaves to a period of apprenticeship that was even more ruthless the planters knew in any case that they can no longer get new slaves from africa they needed a fresh stream of labor to continue earning their profits and to replace what they wrote off as depreciation that is mortality of the slave labor the sugar planters especially in mauritius pressurized the british government to provide cheap labor from the indian subcontinent whereas the anti slavery committee was vehemently against this the british government had just abolished slavery a few years ago and they did not want to impose the same ruthless system on indian laborers so in 
as an alternative to slavery which promoted free labor and free emigration in principle specific conditions of indenture were laid down for the emigration of indian laborers from the port of calcutta and the same were later extended to the ports of madras and bombay the conditions covered the terms of the contract which was for 5 years with a monthly wage renewable for further 5 year terms and with a provision to return to the port of departure after the term further there were even regulations for the ship carrying the laborers such as adherence to standards of space diet hygiene and there was even a medical officer supposed to be on board all that was needed now was cheap indian labor to be transported to the plantations for the indians themselves many steeped in poverty and ravaged by famines in the subcontinent which were exacerbated if not actively created by the british getting work was not easy the promise of wages in far away lands beautifully laid out by a duplicitous recruiter must have felt like a welcome alternative to begging for food and dying hungry the positive correlation between famines in different regions of india and the number of indentured recruits bears this out very clearly the recruiters like the evangelists do targeted those who had no hopes of life in india and promised them heaven on foreign shores given their lack of literacy the indians were mostly duped into signing an agreement which is how the hindi sounding word girmitia was born girmitias were indians who were taken as indentured labor based on the agreement which itself was called by the indians as girmit incidentally the british were not the first to come up with such an agreement for indentured labor in 1826 the french had laid out a similar agreement to send indentured laborers to the island of reunion so from unregulated slavery there was now an indenture system in place and the word slave gave way to indentured labor or what was more common kuli in 1834 36 indian laborers were transported to mauritius from calcutta through such an agreement and by 1838 about 25000 indian laborers were shipped just to mauritius for sugar plantations the frenzy with which rampant recruitment and haphazard transportation happened through all the stipulated conditions of indenture to the wind in 1838 an investigation into detention of recruits revealed how they were forcibly locked up in rooms and beaten up how the recruits were unwilling to travel across the seas once they knew what they had to do and how the police would actively ensure that they boarded the ship the conditions on board the ship were not easy either with such blatant flouting of regulations the british government in 1839 put a stop to further transportation of indentured laborers to its colonies such a temporary suspension of indentured emigration in the face of investigations would become a regular occurrence throughout the indenture period towards the end of 1842 with pressure from european planters the british government lifted the ban and permitted the migration of workers to mauritius from calcutta madras and bombay under very specific conditions just to be clear migration and emigration are rather inappropriate words as they make one think that the indians were moving to a different country on their own accord clearly this was far from the truth for that matter even indentured laborers free laborers or contract laborers or words that mask the crimes of slavery over which much of europe was built anyway in 1843 about 34000 indentured laborers including more than 4000 women were shipped to mauritius from india with the system working extremely well perhaps better than the british had expected they extended the transportation of indentured laborers to jamaica trinidad british guyana and other regions of the caribbean in the second half of the 19th century the story was no different from natal a british colony then but now a part of south africa where the growth of sugar plantations and the reluctance of the local population to work was creating a problem the solution as should be evident by now was simple indentured laborers from india so the first batch of indentured laborers arrived in natal in 1860 and in the next 50 years about 200000 were transported from india mauritius by far received the most number of indentured laborers from india with insatiable demand from the sugar planters added to this the first war of indian independence in 1857 through the normal life of many out of gear 
and they were only too eager to cross to foreign shores for a livelihood. From some 12,000 laborers a year from 1855 to 1857, the number rose to about 30,000 in 1858 and 45,000 in 1859, the highest during the entire indenture period. Other European powers, chiefly the Dutch and the French, also wanted their fingers in the indenture pie. The French, who still had a foothold in India through Pondicherry and Karaikal, were transporting Indian laborers to their colonies stealthily without the knowledge of British. As early as 1830, the French had transported some 3,000 laborers to Reunion, and by 1857, this number had risen to 35,000. The British obviously were not too amused, and in 1860, they permitted the French to transport a limited number of laborers, 6,000 per year, to Reunion and later to the other French colonies of Martinique, Guadeloupe and the French Guyana. The Dutch had hardly any presence in India at the time, but they had vastly expanded in Southeast Asia and parts of South America. The Dutch wanted cheap Indian labor in Suriname for their sugar plantations. So they sold to the British some of their forts along the West African coast, which were built for the earlier wave of transporting African slaves. In exchange for this commercial transaction for human labor, the British allowed transportation of Indian labor to Suriname in 1873, and in that year alone, seven ships sailed from India to Suriname. In about 30 years, from 1840 to 1870, more than half a million Indians were shipped under the indenture system to European colonies, mostly British and French, with more than 350,000 transported just to Mauritius and the rest to other colonies such as Trinidad, Jamaica and British Guyana. With the indenture extended later to other European colonies such as Suriname and Fiji, at least 1.5 million Indians were transported throughout the indenture period. Of course, these are numbers based on indenture records and exclude, for example, the vast number of Indians who were shipped to Ceylon, Burma and Malaya to work in plantations under very different and loose contracts. The story of how and from where the Indian laborers were procured and recruited by the British is worth getting into because that is where the process on the ground started. The first person in the chain of recruitment was called an Arkati or an Arkatia, a tout who usually knew who to target because of their recent deaths, quarrels, crimes and troubles. The Arkati would often be found loitering near public places such as markets, temples and places of pilgrimage and when he zeroed in on a suitable target would narrate fanciful stories of an easy life in foreign lands. The potential recruit would then be made to stay forcibly in a closed room with hundreds of others and after a few days the Arkati would take them all to a licensed recruiter. The recruiter would tell the hapless men and women the nature of their work in plantations, how much they would earn and how long the contract would be at which many would obviously balk. By then, however, it would be too late. The recruiter would impose his authority, threaten them with a fine or a punishment, even imprisonment, all of which were not empty threats, unless they all signed the agreement. With no other way out, would then become Girmitias. By that time, the Arkati would have disappeared, usually along with all the money, clothes and other belongings that the recruits had given to him for safekeeping. In fact, the pattern for recruitment remained unchanged throughout the decades of the indenture system. The system of incentives for the Arkatis was set in such a way that they would invariably use fraudulent means such as enticing people, kidnapping them and holding them against their will to be later passed on to recruitment agents. In the book, A New System of Slavery, the Export of Indian Labor Overseas, published in 1974 and which forms a key reference for this talk, Hugh Tinker writes more about the recruitment process. He says, Though the East India Company recruited heavily from the upper castes, Brahmins and Rajputs for their army, there was no need to look for high caste folk when enrolling men for the sugar plantations. Indeed, there was a ready source of manpower available outside the fold of Hinduism in the semi-aboriginal people who dwelt in the hilly borderlands of the Ganges plain, the people known as Dhangars. The one comment I would like to make, even if tangential to our discussion, is the part about outside the fold of Hinduism. 
evangelists had long since done their work in segregating the tribal customs and traditions from hinduism which made it easier for them to target the tribal population for rampant conversion anyway coming to the dhangars these are ethnic people who inhabit the chota nagpur plateau even today and are known more commonly as kuduk and odao and nowadays the word dhangar is mostly applied to a similar group of people in maharashtra the british however used it for pretty much anyone from the hills who worked as laborers traditionally the orao people used to cultivate the land near hills and you know i would just like to use the name orao for simplicity although the story about the displacement is shared by other groups as well eventually cultivable land became scarce in the hills and the orao moved to the plains for the british this was an unexpected boon as they found the people from the hills to be rather simple and willing to work long hours which is what british called them hill coolies the british first employed the orao in indigo plantations and factories in modern day bihar and nearby regions dwaraknath tagore one of the first indians to partner with british industrialists and the grandfather of rabindranath tagore said in a committee of inquiry that the natives of bengal are naturally an idle set of people hence they are not good workmen and the dhangars being such better workmen or preferred by indigo planters and others once the indenture system was established the orao people became perhaps the largest group of indians transported to british colonies the british preferred them to hindus or other hindus depending on one's perspective because the orao had no qualms of travel to foreign shores and no dietary restrictions as they ate beef pork fish and other meat the british in short found them eager to work easier to deal with frugal and as w w hunter wrote in the annals of rural bengal the hillmen of the west furnished the sinews by which english enterprise is carried out in eastern bengal yet for all that they were just a convenient tool in the hands of british colonialism in a reply to a request for 100 coolies for 5 to 7 years the firm gillanders and company said that the dhangars are always spoken of as more akin to the monkey than the man they have no religion no education and in their present state no wants beyond eating drinking and sleeping and to procure which they are willing to labor in the 1850s the british found that the mortality rate during transportation was noticeably higher among the dhangars than for the others eventually the orao found themselves less favored for foreign shores and instead worked as laborers in tea plantations in assam and other regions for they were still much sought after for diligent labor the british however had to find a new source of recruitment for indentured labor and they found them in the major cities of calcutta madras and to a lesser extent bombay where the poor and unemployed thronged even in those days the recruitment however was active in several regions such as from the modern day bihar jharkhand parts of western uttar pradesh with calcutta as the base the largest in british india with the destination being mostly the british colonies in the caribbean similarly in the south modern day tamil nadu kerala and southern andhra pradesh were the active recruitment regions with madras as the base with the destinations being mauritius ceylon burma and later malaya and fiji after recruitment came the voyage the months of dreary days on board the ship with conditions that were clearly dismal while the journey from calcutta to mauritius took about 2 months the journey to the caribbean was anywhere between 4 to 6 months in 1856 out of 700 laborers who landed in mauritius 280 were dead due to diseases such as cholera and dysentery some en route on the ship and some while waiting in quarantine for the clearance even the british authorities in india were so appalled that they suspended the emigration to indian laborers to mauritius a suspension that was lifted just 6 months later in the year 1856 to 57 the average mortality on ships to the caribbean was about 17% or about 1 in 6 indians just to put this in perspective the mortality on ships carrying british emigrants to australia at that time was about 1% curiously the mortality of ships from calcutta was much higher and an initial investigation pointed to the bad conditions of the emigration depot in calcutta and inquiry that was set in place instead 
came up with reasons such as negligence by ship surgeons and unknown diseases contracted by indian laborers the report even went to the fanciful reasoning of explaining why ships from calcutta had higher mortality than those from madras the madrasi is a lively singing fellow who delights in remaining on deck seldom stays below if, if he can help it the bengali is so much given to remaining below he rapidly gives way to sea sickness and depression when taken ill always imagines that he must die that was the reasoning even when the mortality dropped in subsequent years there were always cases of high mortality right until the early 20th century as if diseases were not enough in the voyage there were other disasters such as what happened to the ship shah alam in 1857 en route to mauritius the ship caught fire and the captain along with all his crew escaped and were rescued by another ship out of the 400 indentured laborers however 399 died another ship eagle speed took off from port canning near calcutta in 1865 carrying 497 indentured laborers out of the crew of 26 only 6 were fit to work the others being either sick or drunk as it was being towed by a streamer the tow rope broke and eagle speed drifted to the sands and sprang a leak as the ship started to sink slowly the captain and the crew made it to safety some of the laborers who then realized what was happening tried to swim and make it to the muddy islands nearby and a few who did so were unfortunately devoured by tigers out of the 497 indentured laborers 265 perished in the catastrophe and the worst part was that they could all have been saved but for the inhuman way in which the crew had abandoned all the indians right from the day they landed in the colony the indian laborers were bonded to the plantation and perhaps the long journey somehow made them accept their fate however coming face to face with grueling labor and cruel treatment something that most had not expected because no one had told them was as much a psychological scar as physical their minds must have frequently transported themselves to the land of their birth remembering the little moments of happiness with their families forgetting even the hardships that they incurred there and brooding over the fate that tricked them into traveling across the black waters for the planters the indentured laborers were there throughout the contract they were for him to exploit which meant that he could make them do what he wanted at the peak season the workers were put through long hours of labor driven by tasks that had to be completed in order to get the full wages even during the slack season the laborers were forced to do some work or the other in the plantations the work overall was so arduous and so unnecessarily manual that there was even a call to spare the life blood of the coolie by the more extended use of implements worked by steam machinery mules and oxen over the years the planters had designed the entire system along with the local officials such as protectors overseers doctors police officers and magistrates in such a way that the laborers were treated like convicts through penalties and punishments which included fines beating flogging denying them their food and water rations confinement and imprisonment some of those who returned from natal in 1871 said that the planters frequently used to tie their hands flog them and put salt water on their backs or tie their necks and send them to the police a report published in 1875 on the treatment of indians in mauritius mentioned that the recklessness of the police in making arrests was only to be equal by that of the magistrates in condemning those arrested the situation had hardly changed in the early 1900s when a magistrate confessed that he was just posted in mauritius as a machine to send people to prison in fiji and british guyana about 20% of the indentured laborers were convicted for some crime or other even in the early 1900s and this after magistrates used to gouge the complainants of their money in a hearing that happened in 1909 w h coombs who was the protector of immigrants in trinidad said of workers complaints that i take their complaint and i tell them plainly that i do not believe them if they persisted he would inform the manager to prosecute them the protector of immigrants a title that has colonial irony written all over it 
hardly ever protected the immigrants and actively connived with planters to make the life of indentured laborers a living hell when the laborers absented themselves because of the extreme conditions the planters used to bring up the explanation that indians had a natural tendency to wander or vagrancy which was also made a punishable offense remember that the planters made up the entire explanation of vagrancy and imposed it as a penalty on the already overworked laborer in mauritius for example vagrancy was not just applied against laborers who were absent but also against those whose indenture had expired the reason was quite simple the planters wanted to ensure that the indenture continued as sending laborers back and bringing in new laborers were both additional expenses they would rather not incur the local police even organized hunts to find and arrest any such indian laborer and this system remained in place until the indenture system itself was abolished in general the life of laborers was restricted to their plantations and they could not even move about unless they had a permit or a pass and of course a permission from the planter and the local authorities the sugar planters wielded considerable influence to make the indenture more and more stringent such as pushing for longer contracts of 5 years as earlier restricting the return to india after the indenture period and even imposing penalty on those laborers who were not under a contract to force them into a continued indenture as i had mentioned earlier the move from unregulated slavery to a system of indenture based on contracts did not really help because the planters with their influence continued to push for more and more one sided contracts even otherwise the planters could get away with anything as the local governments would hardly ever take the side of indians even if they were innocent the contracts for indentured laborers from india had been restricted to a year in response to investigations of mistreatment during the entire indenture process and the sugar planters were pushing for five year terms in the early 1850s the contract was extended to 3 years after which the laborer would have to pay a commutation fee of 5 pounds to become free or else continue for another 2 years after which he could still have to pay a commutation fee which was reduced to 2 pounds so effectively it was a 5 year contract and by 1862 the 5 year contract itself became a norm for the indenture system in different colonies with the commutation fee or a similar payment to be done not many were able to save enough from their wages to even think about breaking free the wages that they earned at the end of the month all but disappeared for the laborer was usually in debt as the planter would have extracted money under some pretext such as the cost of the return journey after the indenture and the local gang leader would have gouged money through extortion and blackmail even the wages although fixed daily or monthly as per the contract were reduced depending upon the tasks completed if the task such as digging a trench 1200 feet long and 6 feet wide was not completed the entire wage for the day was not paid further being absent for work due to sickness also meant forfeiting the wages and sometimes even the food ration in fiji food was doled out as a weekly ration but hardly lasted 4 to 5 days for a laborer who was put on hard tasks which meant that for the other days he would have to go hungry or beg for food from others in mauritius the double cut system was in effect since 1839 which meant that anyone absent for a day would lose the pay for two days this was actually a fine not just a loss of pay and it had to be paid off by working for the equal number of days the next month without any pay in other words the financial situation for the laborer would gradually keep worsening if he was absent for any duration for the planters this was just one more cruel way of exercising their dominance in the mid 19th century when the contracts were drawn up the monthly wage to mauritius was supposed to be about 5 rupees although this was hardly the case in reality as wages were reduced based on incomplete tasks leaves deposits and fines while there was a variation in wages in different colonies and in different circumstances for a given colony the wages hardly changed over the decades in the early 20th century after some 50 years the average wage had increased marginally to about 6 rupees if that was not a big enough blow the planters used to withhold the wages for months together which only pushed the laborers into a bigger debt hole an immigration agent in grenada 
noted in his annual report that the indian laborers are peaceful submissive to orders and industrious they are nevertheless very sensitive and excitable when wages are withheld or not fairly paid to them in other words planters and immigration officials expected the indians to remain docile as that is how they were seen but were surprised when they started demanding their proper wages while the indian laborers did protest these were hardly coordinated and scarcely effective mainly because the planters learning their lessons from the earlier slave rebellions had honed the system to prevent any leadership for rebellion from taking shape the indentured laborers also had their own share of health issues such as fever cholera malaria typhoid and smallpox coolie lines which is what the line of shacks where the laborers lived was called had no proper water supply or provision for toilets the local authorities did not even consider fixing this because according to them indians were supposed to live a life of filth anyway j w burton a zealous missionary in fiji said that coolie lines were one of the saddest and most depressing sights a man can behold although as per the immigration acts and the revisions medical care was to be provided to them this was only followed in letter more than in spirit the doctors were indifferent to the indentured laborers and the hospitals were seldom equipped for any proper treatment the british guyana commission called the plantation hospitals filthy holes the planters considered a sick laborer as a nuisance to be dealt with fast so those who were chronically sick were just thrown out of the plantation and left to survive without a hope the editor of a newspaper in jamaica reported about these wretched hungry houseless and outcast specters picking up in the streets a chance bone or a putrid offal with such merciless conditions of their stay the savage treatment the increasing debts the fear of imprisonment and a prooted life some turned to suicide given the numerically fewer cases of suicide reported by the authorities there was hardly a concern raised as it was at least feebly for their health and hygiene in 1871 the secretaries of colonies did write on the extraordinary frequency of suicides among the indian immigrants in mauritius but attributed this largely to nostalgia and their inability to return to india only later did the british government in india take suicide seriously and that too after an agitation by dada bhai nauroji as the rate of suicides by indians in colonies was more than 10 times higher than that in india one of the reasons cited by the secretary of colonies for the high rate of suicide was the ratio of women which was abysmally low for several reasons firstly the planters were not too keen on getting women in because they saw the indenture as a temporary contract with indian men an extension of the earlier slavery at first introducing indian men blunted the demands of the african laborers who were now free and at the same time the planters did not want indian men to start their own families which could lead to similar rebellious demands in the future secondly they were the social mores of the time which made it more difficult for women to leave india to foreign shores even if it was with their husbands one could only imagine the wives waiting for 5 years only to find that their husbands were perhaps not coming back many did not even know that their husbands had gone overseas either by their own volition or forced by the recruitment agents thirdly the local european government in the colonies did not recognize hindu or muslim marriages which i believe the married women came to know only after they reached their destination also this meant that in case the husband passed away the wife would not see any of his savings because by the local law she was not married to him in natal for example marriages solemnized in india were not recognized until 1914 and this was the same in other colonies too also there were other issues given the shortage of women quarrels dispute murders and even suicides with no marriage recognized there was no sanctity to be attached to the relationship between men and women in an investigation conducted by the fiji administration after the end of the indenture system a medical officer said that the average coolie woman is forced to allow sexual intercourse to the majority of the coolies in the lines in which she lives added to that was the planter the overseer or other officials who would exploit the indian women mostly to show in one more way the power that they wielded over them all <laughs>
Indian women had to put up with the label of prostitutes in the colonies, both by the settlers who were exploiting them and by the natives who were against the presence of Indian men and women. So even when the British authorities in India pushed for a higher ratio of women and threatened to stop emigration if that ratio was not achieved, the reality was much different. With all this, the very thought of bringing a child into the confined world of the plantation was obviously not very welcoming. There was the social burden of a child out of an unrecognized marriage, the financial burden of raising and educating the child, and the emotional burden of protecting the child from the evils that they had to endure. An abortion, therefore, was a way out in case a miscarriage had not already done the work. Overall, for the men and women from India, there was also the cultural displacement, changes in the languages they spoke, in the attire they wore, in the way they celebrated their festivals, in the customs they remembered, and even in their caste, which, as they stepped into the unknown shores, would have ceased to matter. A few temples and mosques, even if rudimentary, were built by the indentured laborers, an oasis of solace in the vast desert of misery that they otherwise lived in. As years passed and many Indian laborers settled down in small ways in colonies rather than returning to India for reasons we would soon get into, there was more zeal towards establishing, preserving and even propagating the traditional roots in the best way possible. In the early 20th century, there was also better communication exchange through permitted newspapers and magazines, which carried religious stories and local news from India, and also through occasional visits of political re leaders and religious gurus. By 1921, when the indenture system had been abolished, the Indian population was about 70% in Mauritius, 50% in British Guyana, 40% in Fiji, and about 30% in Trinidad. A majority of indentured laborers who had arrived to the colonies were Hindus, obviously, and they continued as best as they could to uphold the traditions. By the early 1900s, the Arya Samaj established itself well in Fiji and a few other British colonies. This was perhaps an outcome of the stigma associated with crossing the seas, as many Hindus did not want to travel to the colonies to build and take care of temples and spread the Hindu religion as priests. Although followed by a minority of Hindus, the Arya Samaj promised a progressive form of Hinduism, which was supported by influential leaders of the Indian community. In later years, however, the influence of Arya Samaj on the Hindu community waned, even as Hindus continue to follow their traditions and celebrate their festivals. In his book, Tinker observed that the Indians retain more of their own identity than the transported Africans. A part of this was due to the work done by the Sanatan Dharma Sanstha and the Arya Samaj. A part of this was also due to the tenacity of the Hindu community. The Hindus held their religion dear and generally resisted the ardent attempts by the missionaries who were everywhere to convert them. Even among those who were converted, the community attempted to bring them back to the Hindu fold, a process that was then called Shuddhi, but would now be called Gharvapsi. In his book, Fiji of Today, published in 1910, the missionary author J.W. Burton says, Hinduism makes no fuss. It sits down quietly and in patient, deep disdain, watches with dreamy eyes the other religions quarrel and fight. Yet, even Hinduism can rouse itself and marshal terrible forces when it suspects that any real danger is near. It has the advantage of a great majority in Fiji, and the natural conservatism of its people is a shield against which the fiery darts of all other religions are quenched. Burton then recounts a conversation with a well-educated Brahman, as he calls him, who tells the missionary author, the chances of your becoming a Hindu are much greater than those of my becoming a Christian. After the indenture period was over, which was mostly 10 years, if not more, some managed to earn a livelihood in the colony by leasing smaller farms, plying a small trade or running a small shop. But the discrimination never really disappeared. Sugarcane from a farm run by an Indian, for example, would be procured by European traders at a much lower cost than that from a European planter. In any case, there were other issues such as annual taxes to be paid, the fear of penalties and punishments, and limited access to medical facilities. An ex-indentured Indian, for example, had to first get permission from the immigration office and pay a non-refundable deposit 
before he could visit a hospital even after all that at the end of their contract when someone decided to return to india the conditions of the return journey were worse than the onward one with increased illness and mortality a letter responding to charges of neglect during return journeys talked about the useless expenditure of providing for better food and facilities to the returning indians and said that the emaciated appearance of some upon landing was because they were dissolute and abandoned vagrants the main reason for such conditions was that the acts that were put in place to provide for a more humane treatment of indentured laborers did not actually impose the same conditions on the return journey so no one felt bound to follow any regulations transporting the indian laborers back to india as they did while transporting them to the colonies the planters actively discouraged the laborers from returning because according to the laws they the planters had to pay for the return journey so the planters pushed for changing the contract to do away with the responsibility of arranging any return to india in 1853 the british government in india actually agreed to these terms for mauritius but this was not going to be easy with the caribbean as a compromise the government suggested that the five year contract be extended to a 10 year contract if the laborer wanted to return to india of course someone still had to pay for the return journey which the colonial office said would have to come from the returning indian a majority of those who returned to india after indenture had not much saved and the immigration office more often than not inflated the savings that the indians were taking with them the reason was quite simple to prove using records that the system allowed indians to prosper equitably which was quite far from the truth a few had saved enough money were able to establish themselves in india although as the british noted after paying some money to get back into their caste while this may sound strange today the difficulties faced by those who had abandoned their caste and returned home were not trivial either such was the stronghold of castes that people who returned faced overt censure and continuous disapproval in the society including from their own friends and families many who came back to india with dreams galore therefore decided to return to the colonies and some converted to christianity or islam unable to get over the feeling of being insulted and rejected by their own caste back home now and then the british government in india realized that there were issues throughout the indenture system recruitment by agents treatment of indentured laborers proportion of women rules for the return to india and so on the government was outraged whenever it heard about such iniquities formed commissions to investigate the matter recommended changes for better treatment and even suspended immigration temporarily but there was really no hard stance that benefited the indian laborers also in those days there was no actual indian representation in the legislature of the british government in india except as non officials the british government in india was always at loggerheads with the government in the colonies which prodded by the powerful planters created local laws which were more and more discriminatory against the indian laborers from 1837 when the first act was passed to transport laborers from india the entire indenture system was a series of regulations and counter regulations fine tuned such that it ultimately benefited the powerful planter rather than the indian laborer however there were changes appearing on the horizon in the 1880s the dynamics of sugar production changed as beet sugar gained prominence especially in north america and with that the dominance of sugarcane plantations started to wane gradually leading to lower profits and lower overall demands around the same time the british government in india started encouraging emigration of indians as a policy not just as indentured laborers in new colonies such as fiji but as free people too or as free as the british government would allow its indian subjects in mauritius for example the arrival of indian laborers steadily reduced over the 1870s in fiji which had become a british crown colony in 1874 the first batch of indian laborers arrived in 1879 and continued to grow until the 1900s the immigration policy was partly a result of all the news of dismal treatment of indians in colony after colony that the government had received throughout the 1870s the push for more emigration was in a way deliberate cognitive dissonance by the government which argued that despite the inequities of the indenture system 
the Indian laborers were better off than they would have been in India. And therefore, more Indians should be encouraged to emigrate to the colonies. The support for emigration, which would be the mask under which Indian labor can be made available to the expanding British Empire, at times took flights of fancy such as how it would be more beneficial for women who would otherwise suffer in India or how the increasing population in India was a burden that needs to be ameliorated. The same arguments would be repeated ad nauseum for years to support the indenture system. A sign of the changing times, however, could be gauged from the decisions of the British government in sometimes not allowing Indian indentured laborers in territories occupied by other European powers, such as the French and the Dutch. While there is much that can be found about how the British treated Indian laborers, the treatment by other European colonialists, such as the French and the Spanish, was so worse that even the British were stupefied when they heard about the atrocities. The number of Indian laborers in Reunion, a French colony then, had reduced from 52,000 in 1866 to about 44,000 in 1874 with no repatriation. Assuming that the laborers were dead, this would mean about 1,000 deaths a year or roughly one death every nine hours. In any case, the British had little control over what the French or the Dutch did to the Indians in their own colonies, except suspending now and then the emigration of Indian laborers. In 1881, therefore, when Spain requested Indian laborers who were out of indenture in the Caribbean to be sent to Cuba, the British government simply refused. George Robinson, more commonly known as Lord Ripon, who was then the Viceroy of British India, said that wherever Indian coolies go, it is morally incumbent on us to interest ourselves in their welfare. We have let off the other European colonialists without even a remembrance of the horrors they perpetrated on Indians let alone demanding a reparation. An outcome of how the new emigration policy played out could be learned from Natal, which saw a steady increase in the Indian population from the 1870s through the 1890s, including free Indians who emigrated for business opportunities. With the steady increase in Indians doing businesses, the hostility that the white settlers carried against Indians also steadily increased. The settlers considered Indians as inferior, to be relegated only as coolies in plantation as slaves and prostitutes. They demanded a ban on transporting Indians, whether as laborers or, as, or for business. In the mid-1890s, the planters had their way through the local government in negotiating a compulsory extension of the five-year indenture to another five years, along with a host of other penalties and punishments in what was simply a repeat of what had happened in Mauritius, Jamaica and other colonies over the decades. The Afrikaans in Natal, on the other hand, saw Indians as a threat to their own livelihood and supported a complete ban on Indian laborers, just like the white settlers did. In other words, the Indian was at the receiving end from the colonial settlers as well as the native Afrikaans, both ably supported by the missionaries. A classical colonial strategy the British had perfected of introducing rifts that refused to go away, even today. In any case, the first major spark to demand a better life for indentured Indians came from Natal when a group of Indians, represented by Mohandas Gandhi, expressed their criticism against a proposal to the indenture rules in 1895. The proposal aimed at extending the indenture period to another five years and imposing an annual tax of three pounds on those who had completed their indenture. In a draft that was penned by Gandhi, he argued that the clauses about re-indenture and tax are absolutely useless insofar as they will not produce the desired effect. The desired effect, as the draft cheekily summarized, was what the British government had advanced as a reason for emigration, better prosperity for Indians in colonies and lesser burden on India given her population. The draft criticized such reasoning and recommended that any future immigration to Natal be stopped if the colony cannot put up with the Indians. In a way, the draft was perhaps the first such criticism of indenture and emigration by a group of Indians. Gandhi, who had arrived in South Africa in 1893, soon became the key leader in the fight against the rampant racism of the white settlers, demanding equal rights to all Indians and better conditions for the Indian indentured laborers. During the Boer War in 1900, Gandhi even helped the British through a group of volunteers 
in the hope that this would show the british where the loyalties of the indians lay in a way this may have even worked as lord curzon who was then the viceroy of british india felt that indians in natal should deserve better treatment after all they have done for the british although known more for the disastrous partition of bengal in 1905 which sowed the seeds for later dissension in the subcontinent curzon pushed heavily against the demands of british colonies to send more and more indentured laborers from india as the situation changed from bad to worse gandhi moved on to his satyagraha the first of which was demonstrated in 1906 against a new act in transvaal which made registrations of indians compulsory gandhi told a mass gathering of indians not to register and face the consequences peacefully non violently devising a system of protests involving the masses that would form the cornerstone of his fight against the british gandhi even said that he altered his style of dress as to make it more in keeping with that of the indentured laborers back in india lord minto who was now the viceroy after curzon had resigned was forced to consider the question of sending further indentured laborers to natal amidst rising concerns of racial discrimination in a typical bureaucratic move the colonial office set up an interdepartmental committee in 1909 the sanderson committee as it was called after lord sanderson who was presiding over it was given the task of surveying the entire indenture system in the empire and recommending appropriate changes the seriousness of the sanderson committee in addressing any issue could be gauged by the fact that all their members were british all their witnesses were british officers or ex officers such as proctors emigration agents and magistrates even those financially invested in plantations and all their meetings were held in london so without any hint of surprise most witnesses favored the extension of the indenture system with the same arguments such as better wages and livelihood than in a famine ridden india the sanderson committee published its report in 1910 and recommended continuing the indenture system but with specific regulations for recruitment and reindenture an administrative ledger domain that had been done several times earlier now however there was now a vocal group of restive indian nationalists calling out the discrimination of indians in natal and the key leader among them was gopal krishna gokhale as early as 1897 gokhale had written that the englishmen of natal bring home forcibly to our minds the fact that after all we are only british slaves and not british subjects and that it is idle on our part to expect justice or fair treatment where it does not suit the interests of englishmen to be just or fair the well articulated tirade was a response to the aftermath of the draft that gandhi had written in 1895 the same one that i just talked about which opposed the new rules for reindenture and taxation after the sanderson committee report in 1910 however gokhale demanded a complete end of the indenture system in natal saying that no single question of our time has evoked more bitter feelings throughout india than the continued ill treatment of indians in south africa in 1911 the new viceroy lord harding banned the emigration of indian laborers to natal the demand by gokhale and its subsequent acceptance became the first instance of indian leaders driven largely by indian opinion scoring a win over british policies that for decade had supported an unjust and cruel system the ban was a turning point in the struggle to free indians from the clutches of colonialism in other words the fight against the indenture system was the spark that eventually spread the fight for independence and yet this aspect is hardly ever remembered or talked about after natal the emigration of indentured laborers to mauritius and malaya was also abolished although less for humanitarian reasons and more for reasons of financial viability and change in demands of the plantation produce as with the abolition of slave trade first and slavery much later the status with the indenture system was also the same the ban was on transporting indentured laborers from india a ban on emigration but the indenture system itself continued in the colonies with the indenture period being 5 years or even longer due to the contracts imposed by the planters and enacted by the local government officials the colonies especially natal and fiji knowing the closure window for emigration tried to illegally and hastily recruit as many indians as they could 
while the life of those already under indenture in those colonies was turning out to be even worse a dark era that was reminiscent of the deplorable days of apprenticeship after the abolition of slavery in 1912 gokhale moved a resolution this time asking for a complete end to the indenture system everywhere in an impassioned speech he summarized that though the system cannot be called actual slavery it is really not far removed from it the motion was rejected by the government banning indentured emigration was one thing but banning the entire indenture system meant a death blow to the coffers of the british empire gokhale however was prepared for this and he told the council that the motion to ban indenture affects the national self interest of indians and that it will be brought forward again and again till we carry it to a successful issue gokhale surely set the indian cat among the british pigeons so to speak and the agitation from the viceroy lord harding and others such as lord sanderson was palpable a suggestion was quickly drawn up to send a british indian officer to the colonies who could prove that gokhale's criticism was unfounded the fear was that if they did not do it then gokhale himself would send someone on his own in haste therefore they selected james mcneil from the civil service but they also needed an indian civilian for neutrality preferably someone who had no strong views about emigration and they selected chimanlal a businessman who was also a magistrate together mcneil and lal visited the caribbean and fiji and produced the report in 1913 highlighting positive aspects of the lives of emigrated indian laborers but also indicating widespread punishment low wages high suicide rate and other issues an account of their visit to fiji is given by totaram sanadhya who had been an indentured laborer had later returned to india and published his experiences in a book we will cover sanadhya later but he mentioned how all the conversations that mcneil and lal had with their laborers happened in the presence of the overseers and how the overseers had threatened the laborers with dire consequences if they complained some indian laborers however had written a letter to lal outlining their issues and pleading for a solution in the hope that lal as an indian would be sympathetic to their pains lal however fell ill and according to sanadhya neither mcneil nor lal visited plantations which were notorious for their brutal treatment of indians in a sorry twist to all of this mcneil and lal actually recommended that despite such disadvantages emigration offered an advantage to the indians from simple but secure comfort to solid prosperity at the end of 1913 while the mcneil lal report was still being whispered in select circles gandhi launched a larger satyagraha in natal and he along with 2000 who marched with him were arrested the scale of satyagraha was enough to force the british government to consider a way out of the impasse after continued protests from gandhi and several negotiations especially with jan smut who was the minister of defense in the union of south africa the indian relief act was passed the act effectively ended the indenture system in natal with smuts conceding to all the demands such as abolishing the annual tax of 3 pounds and legalizing indian marriages remember that indentured immigration to natal started in 1860 which means that for more than 50 years marriages that were solemnized in india were not considered legal in natal and what is worse the white settlers perpetuated the humility of calling indian women as prostitutes in any case the indian relief act was still a major victory and with that gandhi departed to india in 1914 the great war made pretty much everything else go low on priority in 1915 gokhale had passed away and gandhi had returned to india although he was still unfamiliar with national politics cf andrews however decided to take the matters in his own hand Andrews a Christian missionary and priest was closely involved with the Indian National Congress and at the behest of Gokhale had moved to South Africa in 1914 to assist Gandhi in his fight Gandhi used to call Andrews as Christ's faithful apostle after his initial CFA CF Andrews and also named him Dinabandhu friend of the poor Andrews wrote to Harding still the viceroy of British India a lengthy letter 
demolishing the Makni Lal report. I have seen these wretched, frightened, quivering, covering Indian coolies with the haunted look in their eyes, wrote Andrews. Maknil evidently has not. If he had, his pages would burn with fire. Harding replied that he would have liked to see indentured labor abolished, but beyond that, he did not promise anything. Andrews, based on the suggestion from Gandhi and others, left for Fiji along with William Pearson, his missionary associate. Harding, from his side, was in a dilemma. The reports he had received in the interim convinced him that the system should be ended. In 1915, after much thought and conviction, he wrote a memorandum in which he said, I venture to urge very strongly upon His Majesty's government the total abolition of indentured labor. And in surprising frankness, mentioned that it is a system of forced labor entailing much misery and degradation and differing but little from a form of slavery. The British government in London was hardly amused at such a direct recommendation coming from a British representative and that too, the viceroy of their crown jewel. In the 1916 Legislative Council, Pandit Madan Mohan Malavia again called for an end to the indenture system, stating that the system has worked enough moral havoc during 75 years. He relied on the findings from Andrews and Pearson who had returned from Fiji and found it to be far worse than anything we have seen. By then, the tide had changed so much that Harding said that the government would accept the resolution. However, there was a catch. The existing system should continue until the colonies can work out an alternative. Harding soon departed and in came the new viceroy, Viscount Kemsford, who was not as interested in ending the indenture system. The intervening war had led to a temporary suspension of indentured emigration anyway. The argument that the system itself is good but needs to be tempered for equitable treatment was getting nowhere. It was an old trick and the Indian leaders were tired of it. For a revised scheme proposed in 1917, Gandhi said that stripped of all the phraseology under which the scheme has been veiled, it is nothing less than a system of indentured emigration. One could say that the British fell into their own trap of educating the Indians in their own laws with their own language and that Indian leaders were now seeing through the very chicanery that was perpetrated without a hitch earlier. Gandhi simply refused to accept that any system of organized emigration would be satisfactory, a point that was also raised earlier by Pandit Malavia and others. Finally, in 1917, the indenture system came to an end although the indentured laborers still under their contract remained in the colonies. In 1918, Pandit Malavia demanded that all existing indentures be abolished and Andrews was in the middle of it all. The resolution was finally accepted despite the demands of the planters to provide an alternate source of labor, a demand that was deemed to be impossible to meet without resorting to at least some form of the indenture system. Even a threat from Fiji that shortage of labor would halve the sugar production fell on deaf ears. For such was the fervor against indentured labor that had been built up by leaders such as Gokhale, Gandhi and Malavia. In the next few years, the indenture system in the few remaining colonies also came to an end. British Guyana in 1919 and Fiji in 1920, but leaving a mess as the British always did. Behind the long struggle to end the indenture system were many other people and their stories are an interesting peek into the era. Totaram Sanadya is one such individual, almost forgotten now except as a passing reference. Born in 1876 in Hirangaon, a small village near Ferozabad in present-day Uttar Pradesh, Sanadya lost his father early. Plunged into poverty and looking for a way out, he met an Arkati who promised him a life of comfort in Fiji, a heaven on earth where he was told that he could eat all the sugar cane and banana that he wanted. A few days later, the Arkati took him, along with 100 men and 65 women, to a magistrate who registered them for the indenture in 20 minutes flat. Later, they were all taken by a train to Calcutta, where the immigration officer told them about the contract, a daily wage of 12 annas with a contract of five years to work in a plantation. Sanadia refused to go to Fiji, saying that he was not fit to work in a plantation, at which he was promptly thrown into a dungeon without any food or water. In the end, with no one to turn to, 
he accepted his fate just as some 500 others did on that voyage in the ship jamna the laborers were given a place of 6 feet by 1.5 and anyone who complained was barked down by the medical officer once settled they were given four biscuits each which the british on board called dog biscuits and some sugar along with a bottle of water twice a day some were asked to cook some to watch over the ship and some to clean up the filth by the time they reached fiji after more than 3 months of voyage they were a group of broken men and women and none of them had a clue of the worst future that awaited them in the plantations after five excruciating years sanadia was free from the contract with some money that he borrowed sanadia leased some land and became a cane farmer himself and spent his time otherwise learning carpentry metal work photography and the local fijian language soon he became a pandit and he had to pay a commission to a merchant to get hindu texts that he could use for conducting ceremonies and singing bhajans and kirtans incidentally he was born a brahman but the arkati back in india had asked him to declare himself as a thakur so that he had a better chance to be recruited in fact many of the temples that were built in colonies came to be overseen by such brahmans after their indenture period sanadia did well as a pandit and he even organized a ram leela in fiji in 1902 Imagine the faces of the indentured laborers watching actors play Ram and Sita on stage transported to the land of their ancestors forgetting for a few moments the day after painful day of hard labor and praying with their hands together and eyes closed for a life that they were once upon a time promised Sanadia knew well the plight of indentured laborers he had been one himself and so he toured the plantations to help them in whatever way he could he would sit at the edge of the fields mostly because the authorities did not allow him inside the plantations and sing bhajans when the laborers came near him he conversed with him about their pains a hurricane in 1911 had devastated fiji and the indian laborers were severely affected along with a few others sanadia formed the british india association of fiji with the chief objective of helping the indians with education representation and justice Indians in Fiji were at the mercy of British lawyers which invariably meant partial judgments and tougher punishments not to mention excruciating bribes Sanadia through the association wrote a letter to Mohandas Gandhi urging him to send an Indian lawyer a barrister then to Fiji who could fight for the Indians Gandhi was himself at that time a lawyer in South Africa and was leading the fight against the systemic racism of the white settlers in 1904 Gandhi had started a newspaper Indian Opinion to highlight the issues faced by the Indian community in South Africa. He published the appeal for an Indian lawyer from Sanadia in Indian Opinion and from there it was picked by Manilal Doctor who was at that time a lawyer in Mauritius. Manilal was interested in helping the Indians in Fiji just as he was helping the Indians in Mauritius and after corresponding with Sanadia he decided to land in Fiji in 1912. Sanadia came back to India in 1914. One could only imagine how momentous the occasion would have been for Sanadia and how he would have felt as he came back to his motherland, touched the earth of his ancestors and met his aging mother after 21 years. Pandit Banarsi Das Chaturvedi, who was a writer in Hindi and was himself concerned about the treatment of Indians in Fiji, had met Sanadia and urged him to write a book about his difficult days. When Sanadia said that he was not a writer Chaturvedi took it upon himself to pen the words even as Sanadia shared his story with their efforts the hindi book Fiji dweep mein mere 21 varsh my 21 years in Fiji islands was published the book was translated into many indian languages and served as a testament to the cruelty of the indenture system the book soon became much talked about by everyone and the message was spread through translations commentaries and even plays in the language of today the book had gone viral the book was banned in fiji but when indentured labor was officially abolished in 1920 sanadia and his book had played no smaller role andrews dinabandhu who we met earlier got the book translated into english and spread its message wherever he could james meston who was then the lieutenant governor of agra and dawad said that the book was widely circulated in india and had reached the women of india who feel deeply on the question sanadia had written many stories about what women faced in fiji 
One was about Kunti, a 20-year-old woman who had been shipped to Fiji along with her husband. In 1912, the overseer, along with the Sardar, the title that was given to the supervisor, tried to molest her. Kunti escaped and jumped into a river, but thankfully was rescued by a boatman. When Kunti complained to the manager, he refused to listen to her. Instead, she was given more arduous tasks and her husband was beaten up severely. Somehow, she managed to get this ordeal published in Bharat Mitra, a Hindi newspaper in Calcutta, which prompted an investigation. But despite threats from the immigration officer, Kunti held on to her words. Another was the story of Narayani, who had just lost her child at birth. The overseer still asked her to show up for work within a couple of days of the incident. When she refused, she was beaten up so much that she fell unconscious. She was taken to the hospital and meanwhile, the case had reached the highest court in Fiji. She was asked to appear, but she could hardly even move. She was taken to the court on a cot and the court, in what was not even surprising, let the overseer walk free. She was beaten up once again so much that she lost her mental balance and continued to live her life that way. Sanadia had met many Indian women when he toured Fiji and talked to them about their life, about how they were duped by the Arkati about their dreary monotony for hours that did not seem to end, about the loss of their husbands and children, about the rootlessness of their existence with nothing to look forward to, about the persecution by the officials. When she lowers her head to hide her tears as she narrates her story, wrote Sanadia, it is impossible to hold back the tears from my own eyes. While Sanadia amusingly recounted the time when Burton, the missionary I mentioned earlier, asked him to convert to Christianity, he also admired the missionary for putting forth the truth about the abysmal life of Indians. Burton had written that the young and brutal overseers on sugar estates take all sorts of liberty with good-looking Indian women and torture them and their husbands in case of refusal. Sometimes, compounders of medicine will call an Indian woman into a closed room, pretending to examine her. Though she may protest there is nothing the matter with her and then torture her most indecently for the gratification of their lust and even for getting her to swear a charge against some Indian who may have incurred their displeasure. Women are known to have been fastened in a row of trees and then flogged in the presence of their little children. No wonder then that Meston commented about Indian women feeling so deeply about the book. Sanadia provided, perhaps for the first time, a first-person account of life as an indentured slave, recounting the horrors of the system that existed only to satisfy the lust of European colonialism. When he passed away in 1947 at the Sabarmati Ashram, Gandhi wrote about Sanadhyaya, With his ektara and bhajans, he would enchant the residents of the ashram. The same bhajans that he must have sung while sitting on the edge of the plantations in Fiji and looking at the plight of his brothers and sisters. Yet, as is our inexplicable habit of ignoring heroes that really matter, there is hardly a memorial for the crusader in Fiji, from what I gather, or back here in India. Manilal doctor, who was recommended by Gandhi to go to Fiji to help the Indian community, was actually a lawyer. The last name doctor was the profession of his father. In 1901, when Gandhi had briefly visited Mauritius, he was appalled at the state of the Indians. A few years later, he urged Manilal to move to Mauritius and help the Indians there in much the same way that Gandhi himself had done in Natal. On October 11, 1907, Manilal landed in Mauritius and the day is still observed as Manilal Day in the country. The situation with British lawyers in Mauritius was no different than in other colonies and Manilal fought for a balance in judgment meted out to the Indians as disproportionate punishment was rather the norm. The struggle was hard, Malinal knew about it because it was a one-sided system that refused even basic justice to Indians. In 1909, he started a journal, Hindustani, to spread awareness about the conditions of indentured Indians in Mauritius. At the behest of Gandhi and Sanadhyaya, Manilal landed in Fiji in 1912 to a cheery welcome not just by the Indian community but also by the native Fijians who sang and danced at his arrival. We could only imagine how atrocious the British lawyers would have been to the native and the immigrant populations and at the same time we could sense how much the movement against the British had gathered steam by then. Manilal used his experience in Mauritius to help Indians in Fiji 
including sending letters and petitions all the way to London to get justice for them. Of course, this only made the local British government angry with him. In 1915, just three years after he had arrived in Fiji, a petition was filed with the governor to nominate him to the Legislative Council as a representative of the Indian people. The British government back in India, in what would be a typical divisive political move, recommended instead Badri Maharaj. Maharaj was a successful farmer and had established the first Indian school, the Wairuku Indian School. But he was not a popular choice as a leader and there were petitions sent to the government to reconsider its choice and select Manilal doctor. The British simply turned a deaf ear to the protests. In 1917, Manilal started the first newspaper by an Indian in Fiji, Indian Settler. And the next year, he formed the Indian Imperial Association of Fiji, the successor to the one that was formed by Totaram Sanadia and others earlier. The association fought against the same issues, but by now, with Manilal at the helm, it had better success and visibility. In 1919, the Indian Imperial Association also appealed to the British government to end the indenture system, annul all existing indenture agreements, and along with that, requested a host of improvements to the living conditions of Indians, such as improved education facilities, abolition of hut tax and hawker licenses, better road to Indian settlements, better compensation, and generally a treatment at par with the Europeans. All these requests were ignored. In 1920, Indian laborers went on a strike demanding better wages for their work in the public works department in Suwa. Although peaceful at first, the strike turned violent due to the high-handedness of the police. Further, the British played their divisive role by increasing the wages of some Indians, but not all, and creating a schism within the workers. With state-sponsored violence, the Indians gave in and gradually returned to work. The British government in Fiji finally found a way to get rid of Manilal, for they accused him of the violence and prohibited him from staying in Fiji by invoking an old law. In 1920, Manilal was deported from Fiji, but his troubles were far from over. The British government refused to allow him to practice law in most places, and even in India, they prohibited him from practicing in Bombay and Madras high courts. Gandhi said that an empire that requires such calculated persecution of a man without even trying to prove anything against him deserves only to be dissolved. Manilal moved to Gaya, practiced at Patna High Court, and got attracted to socialism and communism the viral ideology of the day, which was trying to get a foothold into mainstream by recruiting people like him to infiltrate the behemoth that the Congress then was. When the indenture system was finally banned in 1920, the after the culmination of relentless work from courageous people such as Totaram Sanadia, Manilal Doctor, J.P. Maharaj, Babu Ram Singh, Ram Roop and many others, there must have been a wave of relief for the Indians in Fiji. But the aftermath was like the one of a devastating cyclone that had passed. The task of putting together the broken shards of lives and still fighting for justice in a world dominated by British colonialists was not easy. Further, as the British have done in all colonies that they have left, there are ethnic, racial, social and religious fissures that just refuse to go away, even now. In 1970, when the British granted independence to Fiji, and left it with a constitution that gave Hindus and other Indians in Fiji unequal rights, the aftermath was a wave of persecution from the native Fijians. Throughout the 80s and 90s, Hindus had been persecuted continuously, abetted by the church because by then the native Fijians had been mostly converted to Christianity. Many Hindus left Fiji to other countries. A second forced displacement just about a century after their ancestors were displaced deceitfully from India. Hindus constituted about half the population of Fiji in 1970, only to be reduced to less than a quarter nowadays. As the popular but arguable saying goes, no country for Hindus. Fiji is one such colony, one such playground, where British racism and colonialism reared its ugly head that led to mass displacement of ethnic groups, their unequal and inhuman treatment as indentured laborers, and untold strife with the native population which continues to this day. The post-indentured period for decades has been one filled with strikes, riots, oppression, discrimination, and racism. The stories of grit and sacrifice exist in other colonies too.
Mauritius, Trinidad, Jamaica, Burma, Ceylon, South Africa, Kenya, and many others buried in the soil of these lands or scattered in the ocean breeze. With the changing zeitgeist, however, one sees the remembrance in erstwhile colonies in the form of associations, memorials, statues, museums, names of streets and towns, processions, festivals, and even commemorative days. Indian Arrival Day is a holiday in Mauritius, Trinidad and Tobago, Fiji, Guyana, Grenada, Suriname, and other countries. In Fiji, May 14 is observed as Girmit Remembrance Day, as the first ship of indentured Indians had arrived on that day in 1879. The story of displacement from the land of their ancestors, the life of servitude in the name of indentured labor, the rebuilding of a future in a place that was still as hostile to them or too few. V.S. Naipaul, for example, was one of the few writers of the English language who used these themes in his fictional and non-fictional works. Although more such work exists in Hindi and perhaps other Indian languages, which needs to be brought out and explored. However, given the enormous importance of the indentured era to the independence movement, and the enormous upheaval that was set in motion by the lust of European powers, chiefly the British, in expanding their commerce and spreading their religion. We hardly have enough stories. A deconstruction of the post-indenture developments would be a discussion for another day. We should, however, reach out to those who had migrated out of India by force or by choice and listen to stories about their families, their forefathers, their descendants, stories about their struggles for equality, for representation, for justice, for freedom, for finding and founding a home away from home. I am not talking about a political or a diplomatic connection, although that can be improved as well. Just as an example, before Prime Minister Modi visited Fiji in 2014, the last visit by a Prime Minister was by Indira Gandhi in 1981. I am talking about a cultural connection. What does India mean to them today? How do Hindus of Fiji or Guyana or Trinidad preserve their traditions? And how have these traditions diverged in the last century or so? With that, I would like to conclude the episode on slavery and indenture during the British era. Do not forget to subscribe to Atharva Forum. And until next time, Namaste.